if you have younger kids, you know that when they get excited about something, it's hard to get them calmed down. I still remember when my daughter started taking karate lessons. She wanted to try practicing at home, and I took a roundhouse that made me feel like I was carrying around Tom Brady's deflated footballs from the 2014 AFC Championship game for the next week and a half. Well, in fantasy football, you don't want to take a roundhouse to the growing because you decided that you wanted to join the hype on some players and overdraft them. So in this video, I'm going to talk about several players that will potentially be overdrafted in 2020 and why you need to be careful and not buy into the hype. What's going on, Headliner Nation? Welcome back to the Fantasy Headliners. Kyle coming back to you talking about some overvalued players on draft day here in 2020. Now, this isn't necessarily telling you that their current ADP is bad. Maybe their ADP right now isn't that bad. But as we get into draft season and get closer and closer and closer to the season, some hype tends to build up around players. And when that happens, you might catch yourself wanting to reach for some of these guys because you really want to have them on your roster. So this group of players I've got in this video are some of my choices for guys that I really expect to be overdrafted and overvalued on draft day this year and why you should be really careful about where they end up going in your drafts. Now let me just go ahead and point out one thing. This is a this is not a do not draft video. I am not telling you not to draft these guys. I'm just telling you for where they might be going come draft day, it might be a little bit too expensive for the return that they can offer you. So hit that like button and let's get ready to dive into several players that will likely be overdrafted in 2020. All right, to kick it off, I've got two quarterbacks that I want to talk about. And this is why it's really important to remember that I'm not telling you not to draft these guys. Because honestly, everybody wants Lamar Jackson and Patrick Holmes, Mahomes on their team, right? I mean, I want them on my team as well. However, I'm really worried that both of these guys are going to end up sneaking up into the middle of the second round in redraft leagues. Now, if you are in a one quarterback league, this is where you need to really pay attention. If you're in a super flex league or a two quarterback league, then taking either of these guys in the second round probably isn't that bad of a deal, even though personally, I would like to wait. But for those of you in a one quarterback league, I want you to just take a look at a couple of different things. And these numbers are based off of players that we saw go last year in the second round and the fifth round. So the fifth round is kind of that 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 nice spot in the middle of a draft where a lot of fantasy football players like to start drafting quarterbacks. Yeah, they could go a little bit later, they can go a little bit sooner, but right around round five is when you start to get the majority of your team built up. You've got a couple of running backs, a couple of wide receivers, maybe you've got a wide receiver, a couple of running backs, and tight end, whatever it may be. At that point, it's a little bit more safer to start drafting quarterbacks. So I wanted you to see points per game based on these two rounds. Round two, where Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson will probably end up going, and round five, where some other guys will end up going. So if we get to round two and Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes are there sitting on the board, quarterbacks in round two, you're going to be getting about 25 points per game from them. Okay, And I included Lamar Jackson in these totals, even though he wasn't drafted in round two last year. I included guys that are potentially going in round two this year with Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes, what they've scored in the past, and what other guys who have been taken so early have scored before as well. So I've got several different things kind of tied into this point per game. But round two quarterbacks might end up giving you about 25 point per game, where a running back in the second round might end up giving you about 15 points per game. So when you look at it there, you say, well, heck, I'll take a quarterback because I'm getting an extra 10 points per game right there. But let's roll down the board a little bit and get to round five. If we get to round five, quarterbacks that are potentially going to be taken there and have been taken there in the past, you're going to be getting about 18 points per game from them, whereas running backs in round five, you're going to be getting about 10 points per game. So you're still going to be getting about eight more points per game from your quarterbacks there than you will be from your running backs. But this is why this point makes a lot of sense, and I hope you understand where I'm coming from. In round five, you're probably not getting your running back one. You might not even be getting your running back two, depending on what how your draft has gone. 
when you get to round five, the running backs that you'll be taking in round five are much less plug and play type running backs than what you'll get with some of the top tier guys in round two. So even though you'll be getting a little bit of a difference in the points per game from the running back to the quarterback in each of those rounds, you're going from about 15 points per game down to 10 with a lot more volatility at the running back position. Whereas for the quarterback, you're going from 25 to 18, but you're still going to have a starter. You're still going to have a top tier quarterback that you can put in your lineup every single day. You're not going to necessarily get that from a running back in round five. And that is why for those of you in, in any type of a one quarterback league, you really need to focus on how your scoring is done in your league and whether or not it really does make a lot of sense for you to take a quarterback that early. If you can get like a Russell Wilson in round five and you can get yourself a Nick Chubb, a Josh Jacobs, a Joe Mixon in round two, I would much rather have that than getting a Lamar Jackson or a Patrick Mahomes in round one and let's say maybe a Melvin Gordon in round five. So hopefully that makes a whole lot of sense, and that is why I'm a little bit worried about those two quarterbacks going super early in drafts this year. But now we're done talking about quarterbacks. Let's move on to our running backs, and we're going to talk about Aaron Jones. Now, last year on this channel, we pushed Aaron Jones. We said, go get him in your drafts. Breakout season coming, and it absolutely happened. Now, if you tuned into our live show on Facebook the other night, I gave some of you a little bit of a sneak peek into this, into these stats that I have here for you. So some of you might be hearing this information, but if you are not a part of that live show on Facebook, make sure you understand exactly how difficult it is going to be for Aaron Jones to replicate what he did last year when he scored 16 rushing touchdowns. There have only been 10 players since 2000 to have 15 rushing touchdowns in a season. So since 2000, we've only seen 10 instances where people are rushing for as many touchdowns as Aaron Jones rushed for last year. But no player has rushed for 15 touchdowns in back-to-back seasons since Terrell Davis did that in 1997-1998 with the Broncos. So it has been even longer since a running back has been able to go back-to-back seasons with 15 or more touchdowns. And Aaron Jones, if you look at his rushing attempts and rush yards, 15th in rushing attempts, and 12th in rushing yards. Those two stats alone are not numbers that you are going to see from high-end running back once. So absolutely, 100%, Aaron Jones was inflated last year by his 16 rushing touchdowns. And here are where things get absolutely crazy, and these are why there is no way he's going to be able to replicate these stats. He scored on 41%. 41% of his red zone rushing attempts last year and 58% of rushing attempts within the five yard line. So when he touched the ball, when he got the ball at the five yard line or closer, he scored half the time he touched the football. You've brought in AJ Dillon now. The coaching staff has said twice this season, once before the draft, that they would like to have another running back to make this a three headed committee. You have Jamal Williams. Do you honestly think that you're going to bet on Aaron Jones being able to score 16 rushing touchdowns again and be as highly efficient as he was in the red zone? I don't think so. He's going to be going in the second round in a lot of drafts. Steer clear of Aaron Jones in the second round. I would much rather have you take a Travis Kelsey. I would much rather have you take one of the quarterbacks we just talked about, a Josh Jacobs, a Joe Mixon. I would much rather have you all focus on those guys than Aaron Jones in the second round because there is no way he's going to be able to replicate the season that he had last year. He was too highly efficient and did not get nearly enough volume to keep up with those numbers. uh, Staying on running backs, though, let's talk about rookie running backs. This is where people get in trouble every single season. This year, we've got Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Jonathan Taylor, Cam Akers, Kayshawn Vaughn, and Zach Moss. Those are really like the main running backs that people are talking about having a type of impact here in 2020. Let's talk about where rookie running backs typically finish. The average finish for rookie running backs the last two years has been running back 36 and half PPR leagues. Over the last couple of years, there have only been two rookie running backs that have finished as a running back one, and there have only been five rookie running backs to finish as a running back two. 
So you can look at these and you can say Clyde Edwards Hilaire and Jonathan Taylor probably have the best shot at finishing as a running back two or higher. They're on a team that is going to heavily utilize the running back position, but we still have questions about the players in front of them, both Damian Williams and Marlon Mack. If you look at the guys that have finished as running back twos the last couple of years, they have been guys that haven't had a lot of competition for touches. Miles Sanders finishes a running back 13 last year. Yeah, he had Jordan Howard to begin the year, but then Jordan Howard ended up getting hurt, and Miles Sanders was the guy and really pushed himself up the boards all the way up to running back 13, which is a strong finish. Josh Jacobs finished as the running back 18 and a half PPR. Had a really good season, but he wasn't really fighting anybody for touches on the ground, and they heavily utilized him. Saquon Barkley, absolute stud, finishes the running back to his rookie year, but that's because they gave him the ball. They drafted him They drafted him in the top five, so they're going to utilize him, right? And then for Phillip Lindsay, he finishes the running back 12 his rookie season, but he was undrafted, and he came out of nowhere. He ended up beating out Royce Freeman. Royce Freeman was a popular pick to be a guy that finished much higher. But what about guys like David Montgomery? Devin Singletary, Tony Pollard, Alexander Madison, Darwin Thompson, Daryl Henderson, last guy, last year rookies that were absolutely hyped up being able to take touches away from people in front of them. Montgomery finishes the running back 25, Singletary 31, Pollard 52, Madison 59, Thompson 89, Daryl Henderson 96. People were all over Daryl Henderson because they thought that Todd Gurley wasn't going to be able to keep up with the workload, that he was going to be sitting a lot. Dude was barely inside the top 100 running backs, not even the top 100 players. And then a couple of years ago, you got a guy like Sonny Michel headed to New England. A lot of people are like, oh, perfect fit, running back 28, carry on Johnson. Running back 34. Okay, Royce Freeman, again, the year that Philip Lindsay ended up finishing so high, Royce Freeman was supposed to be the guy. Running back 46. One of the issues that I have over on Twitter, if a lot of you are on Twitter, one issue I have over there is that there's a lot of dynasty analysts, a lot of dynasty football analysts over on Twitter that are constantly pushing rookie running backs down your throat. Because they want you to get them now so you can own them. But if you're a redraft player, you got to be careful and tune out some of those noise about these rookie running backs. With Keyshawn Vaughn, yeah, he could touch the ball a little bit this season, absolutely. But he's being hyped up to the point by some people that some of you might expect him to be a running back too. Ronald Jones isn't good in pass protection, but he's a pretty good athlete that can do a lot with the ball after he gets it. Keyshawn Vaughn isn't going to be the unheralded starter there. Zach Moss, the Zach Moss love drives me nuts right now because with Zach Moss, he his injury profile is absolutely horrible and he's got Devin Singletary and TJ Yeldon in front of him. People are completely forgetting about TJ Yeldon with Buffalo. Zach Moss is a grinder in the middle of the tackles. He's a little bit slow on the outside. He doesn't really have that burst to get around the outside and get away from some of those faster linebackers. He's going to make his he's going to make his money in the middle of the field, short yarded situation and goal line situations. But people are talking about him like you should be taking him over Devin Singletary this year cuz Zach Moss is going to end up being the guy. We got to be careful with that. Rookie running backs do not typically finish that high for you to be spending high round draft picks. You got to work your way through the weeds. You got to trim that bush down. You got to be able to see it for what it really is. And you have to be careful that you don't get stuck in that mess. And speaking of trimming that bush down and not getting stuck in that mess, Make sure you head over to Manscaped, our partners over at Manscaped. If you go over there, if you want to get anything um, anything at all from them, any of their crop preservers, their cleansers, their tools over there, anything at all, you enter the promo code HEADLINERS, all capital letters, and you are going to get 20% off. You can go get the perfect package that's got the lawnmower 3.0 in it. And if you need to trim through those bushes, whether it be fantasy football or <clears throat> your own, you can use the Lawnmower 3.0 and you can make yourself feeling hashtag hella smooth. Make, make sure you head over to manscaped.com. Promo code headliners, all capital letters, 20% off. Let's keep it going now and we're going to head over to wide receivers and we're going to talk about Adam Thielen for a second. I don't, ha- I don't hate Adam Thielen this year at all, but I am worried you're going to have to spend a decent pick on him to get him because the closer we get to the season, people are going to be like, oh, he's now the wide receiver one in Minnesota. It's a heavy run game there, so he's going to get targets. And he's going to be able to do a lot with them. But I want you to take a look. Games played with Stefan Diggs. 
Okay, this is from 2015. Since 2015, he's played 60 games with Stefan Diggs on the field. He's averaged 13.55 points per game, 6.67 targets, 5.65 receptions, 63.6 yards, and 0.37 touchdowns per game. Those are all a per game stat. When Stefan Diggs has not been on the field, seven games that Adam Thielen has played with no Stefan Diggs, his point per game is actually less, more than a full point per game less than what it is with him on the field. And even though his targets go up to eight and his receptions go up to 5.14, his yards dramatically drop from 63 to 51. Less than 10 yards per game than what he would average with Stefan Diggs on the field. And his touchdowns per game drop from 0.37 to 0.29. So Stefan Diggs has been a guy that has always been able to draw players down the field, draw a bunch of attention his way, and he's typically faced the cornerback one from the other team. Adam Thielen, 58% of his career routes, he's been lined up outside. So almost he's almost split half and half between being on the outside or being in the slot, and he's greatly benefited from his time of being in the slot. But now he's going to have to line up outside way more often, and he's likely going to pull the cornerback one from the other team every single game. That's going to be a big change for him and something that he's going to have to develop into is being that wide receiver one, being that guy can that can do absolutely everything and not being a guy that just solely relies on running out of the slot, finding the open field and kind of going from there. Adam Thielen's been really good the last couple of years. I don't want to take anything away from him, but I don't think he's the wide receiver one everyone hopes that he can be in 2020. Justin Jefferson is more than likely going to play out of the slot more more than Adam Thielen will. I don't necessarily agree with that from Thielen's perspective, from but but from just Je- Je- uh, Jefferson's perspective and his growth, it's probably best for him. So you need to be really careful with Adam Thielen next year because moving to the outside, no Stefan Diggs, continuing to really focus on the run game. Maybe you see some more two tight end sets as well with Irv Smith Jr. and Kyle Rudolph. Those two guys could get much more involved in the passing game as well. And maybe maybe Thielen doesn't see some of that same volume that he's seen with Diggs being off the field. But another wide receiver we got to be really careful of this year is Devontae Parker. I've talked about Devontae Parker quite a bit, but I wanted to spell it out for you all a little bit more because I still think that this is a guy that people are going to be drafting, expecting him to be their wide receiver two and finish as a high wide receiver two. I'm thinking Devontae Parker is more along the lines of a wide receiver three for me this year. Why is that? Well, it really all hinges on Preston Williams and what he ends up coming back looking like. If he's fully healthy, if he takes some more time, Weeks 1 through 9 last year, with Preston Williams on the field, Devontae Parker saw 6.5 targets per game, 3.5 receptions, 50 yards, and 0.5 touchdowns per game. When Preston Williams went out, though, his numbers jumped dramatically, up to 9.5 targets, up to 5.5 receptions, and another 50 yards per game. His touchdowns did jump from 0.5 to 0.62, but it's that 50 yards to 100 yards that makes a whole lot of difference. And also, don't keep in mind as well that they might have an increased focus on the run game this year. They've added Jordan Howard. They've added Matt Breida. They had a they had a, a league low 21.8 rushing attempts per game as a team last year. They've upgraded the offensive line. They've upgraded the backfield. Yeah, you've got Ryan Fitzpatrick, who is a gunslinger. Ryan Fitzmagic, he's going to be throwing it all over the place. He can go deep. But with Devontae Parker, he was so reliant on all of that volume at the end of last season. It's hard for me to invest in him as my wide receiver, too, and expect that volume to keep up. Because if the volume doesn't keep up, is he actually going to be able to finish as a wide receiver, too? That ball is going to be spread around a whole lot more this year. Mike Gisecki is going to end up having a better year this year. I've talked about Jakeem Grant. I've talked about Albert Wilson. Both of those guys can be playmakers if they get the balls in their hands. So eh, we'll end up seeing what happens. With Devontae Parker, I think he's going to be overdrafted come draft season this year, and I want you to be really careful about that. 
Before we head out of here, though, Headliner Nation, don't forget the draft guide is available for pre-order. By the time you watch this video, it may be out. I don't know. We're really, really close. We were hoping for it to be out this weekend, if not really early next week. It's going to be super close. It's awesome. It, I've already had a chance to look through everything that's done so far, and it is going to be fire. Make sure you pre-order yours now for $19.99. Get it at thefantasyheadliners.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode, Headliner Nation. Do me a favor. Go down below, hit that like button. Leave a comment below and let me know what you thought about the video. Questions, comments, concerns, anything you agree or disagree with. And of course, if you're new to the Fantasy Headliners, hit that subscribe button for me and become a part of Headliner Nation today. Have a great one. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Fantasy Headliners. Oh,